you're going to take your Bible and go to Matthew 7. We're going to continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount. The title of the message is, Who Made You Judge? Anybody ever asked you that before? Who died and made you judge? You say, well, what's this got to do with Father's Day? Well, don't judge Dad so harshly. He's doing the best he can. Amen. Nobody's perfect. So uh, we'll apply it that way. If you've been with us through our study, so far Jesus has talked about our relationship with God, then our relationship to things. Now he's going to deal with our relationship with other people. We've all met and known people who are always criticizing others. I don't think we've got anybody like that here today, but we know of people like that, don't we? Always criticizing, judging others. That's what he's talking about here. That we don't need to be doing that. We don't need to be judging one another in that sense. It reminds me of an evangelist who had preached in a church, and uh, at the church, he and the pastor were standing at the door, shaking hands with people as they left. A little boy walked up to him and said, That was the poorest sermon I've ever heard. Went on his way. Evangelist kind of, you know, taken aback by that. A little bit later, same boy comes along and says, you'll never preach in this church again. Went on his way. A little bit later, same boy came by and said, you won't get much of an offering here after that sermon. The evangelist looks at the pastor and pastor, I, I don't pay him any mind. He just repeats what he hears. That's what we do sometimes. We repeat things that we shouldn't. And I think some are so quick to think the worst of others and so slow to think the best of others. It's been said in, in judging others, some seem to work at it overtime with no pay. I guess they think that's their gift, the gift of criticizing. That's one gift you can go ahead and bury, Amen. Just bury that one and don't use it. Somebody said there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it hardly behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. Might be something to think about. Jesus talks about judging others. Let's look at the first six verses in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mole or the speck in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Amen. Think about this. The word judge here that Jesus uses is about making decisions about others or coming to a conclusion about something or someone. It can mean to evaluate, but it also can mean to condemn. That's what he's talking about here. The idea of condemning others in such a way, being overly critical about other people. We need to be careful about that. Don't become like a certain dog I heard about. Say there once was a dog named August who was always jumping at conclusions. One day he jumped at the conclusion of a mule. That was the last day of August. <laughs> Amen. Be careful about jumping to conclusions. 
Now let me say this. This is one verse the world loves to quote. Judge not. Don't judge me. Now Jesus, is he saying that we should never ever judge or maybe evaluate anyone? Well, he goes on to say that we've got to be careful about casting pearls before swine, that which is holy unto dogs. Well, don't you have to make a little evaluation before you can do that? So he's not saying that this uh, involves every kind of judgment. He's saying that we need to be careful that we, although we need to discriminate at times, not to just become so critical about everything. Matter of fact, in this passage, he gives us three things to look out for, doesn't he? Logs, dogs, and hogs. There's the beam, that's the log. He talks about the dogs and the hogs. So you're going to have to use a little bit of discrimination in uh, such doing that. So let's think about this this morning. Who are we to judge? First of all, note the role we take on ourselves when we do this. He describes the judge or the critic doing something that he is not called upon to do. First of all, think about the judgment that we await. All of us are going to be judged one day. Not by others, but by God. There's a judgment day coming, right? There's coming a day where we're all going to have to stand before God in judgment. You see that all through the Bible. Let me give you some verses. Hebrews 12, 23. There it says, God is judge of all. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Paul said, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So God is a righteous judge. He's judge of all. The Bible speaks in Romans 2, 16 of a day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So there's a coming, a judgment day. It's coming for all of us. We're all going to stand before God. We're going to give an account of things done in this life. Write this verse down, 2 Corinthians 5.10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now this is a judgment of saved people. All that have been born again and believe in Jesus Christ, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a judgment day for the saved. Not to determine your sin, that's already been covered. But this is just to look at your life and see whether or not you should receive rewards. So there's a judgment day coming. Does that make you nervous to think about standing before God to be judged? When you kids get in trouble at school, do you ever get sent to the principal's office? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? On the way you're quoting Isaiah, woe is me for I am undone. <laughs> On the way to the principal. Now he's the last person you want to see. His office is the last place you want to be. There you are going down the hall to the principal's office. All the other kids are saying, dead man walking. <laughs> You're dead. Now, think what it's going to be like standing before, not a principal, but the God of the universe. Can you imagine that? Standing before God Almighty, to be judged. Your life is going to be examined. So there's a judgment awaiting all of us. We're going to have to face our judge one day. But you're not my judge. He's my judge. All right? So secondly, there's the judgment that we assume. We judge others. We do so, we're taking upon ourselves the role of judge and jury and sometimes executioner. We're going to fill every role. We sit in judgment of others. We do so, we're assuming a role that was not given to us. Amen. There's no office of judge in the church that I know about. But we judge others, he says, 
Understand that you're going to receive similar judgment. As you judge others, so shall you be judged. It goes back to that principle, you're going to reap what you sow. Amen. What you give out is going to come back to you. People are going to treat you the way you treat them. You know, I think we all have our yardsticks that we use to judge others. We need to be careful that that yardstick doesn't become a boomerang and come back to us to condemn us. I heard about a guy who bought a new boomerang and he killed himself trying to throw the old one away. <laughs> See, it comes back to him, Holly. You throw a boomerang, it comes back. It can hit you. Be careful about that. So sometimes we want to know, who died and made you my judge? See, it's difficult for us to judge others because we don't have all the facts. Right? We don't usually have the motive behind what somebody did. Now, we don't know, but God does. God knows all the facts. God knows the motives behind what we do and why we do it. So he's qualified to be the judge, but we're not. I heard about a guy who owned a manufacturing plant. One day he was visiting the warehouse. He saw a young man leaning up against some boxes with his hands in his pockets, uh, just doing nothing. And he watched this young man for a while. He, he just got very agitated watching this young man doing nothing. So he walks over to him and he says, How much are you paid a week? Young man spent $400 a week. The boss pulled out his wallet, took out four $100 bills, handed it to the young man and said, take this and get out of here and don't ever come back. The young man took the money, shrugged and walked off. The warehouse manager walks up, he sees this, he's kind of puzzled. The boss says, how long has that loafer been working for us? He says, sir, he doesn't work for us. He's just delivering packages. <laughs> it helps to know the facts, doesn't it? Before you judge others. It was a good day for the young man, though, wasn't it? Got a tip. Here's the second thing I want you to think about. The review we take of ourselves. Instead of worrying about others and what they're doing or not doing, Jesus said we ought to be concerned with our own lives, with our own actions. So you might remember the old song, it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Is that true? First of all, Jesus spoke of the failures we often criticize in others. He's describing somebody finding fault in another person. He's basing this on his own standards, his own opinion about things. He's sitting in judgment of that person. That word behold us, beholding the mote in your brother's eye, that means to really look. To behold means to really look carefully for something. Now, Jonathan, do I have a speck in my eye? You can't tell from there, can you? To see a speck in somebody's eye, you've got to get up close, don't you? You've got to really examine carefully to see a speck in somebody's eye. That's the way people are. They're very critical, and uh, they really get up close in inspecting your life and your actions. But... The Bible says in Romans 14, 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. If you send a buzzard out to survey a land, you know what his report would be? He would come back and say, Well, I saw three roadkill, a possum, a deer, and an armadillo. 
which they call a Texas speed bump down there, Armadillo. Now, why would a buzz? That's what a buzzer would be looking for. Amen. That's what he'd be looking for. He wouldn't even pay attention to the flowers and the, the fruit trees and all of that. He's looking for roadkill. Now, what I mean is there are people like that. They're always looking for something to criticize. Always wanting to fix you and straighten you out. You know anybody like that? By the way, you can always find something wrong with anybody. I mean, if you look close enough, if you look hard enough, you can find fault in anybody. Because there's no perfect people. Amen. We all have our faults. We all have our flaws. Now, there are some people who think they're perfect. Amen. Preacher once asked his congregation one Sunday if they knew anybody that was perfect. And he was surprised to see a man raise his hand. And he said, who do you know that's perfect? He said, well, I've never met him, but it was my wife's first late husband. Because he's always comparing me to him, and I never come up to standard. Amen. Hey, here's a riddle. You like riddles? Sure you do. See how good you are at this one. There was a perfect man and a perfect woman who met at a perfect party, dated for two perfect years, had a perfect wedding, a perfect honeymoon, then had two perfect children. One day this perfect man and perfect woman were driving along and they saw Santa Claus on the side of the road, broken down. So they picked him up and gave him a ride. But they got into an accident. Two people died, only one lived. Here's the riddle. Who died and who lived? Well, it's the perfect woman that lived. Because we all know the perfect man in Santa Claus don't exist. You're thinking about that one, aren't you? Amen. I appreciate Betty sharing her illustrations with me. <laughs> but we all know the only perfect person who ever lived was Jesus Christ. And you can say amen to that, amen. He's the only perfect person who's ever lived on this earth. So instead of criticizing others, secondly, we ought to consider ourselves. Jesus talks about somebody having a beam in his eye trying to remove a speck from somebody else's eye. Now we call that a hyperbole, an exaggeration to make a point. Can you imagine somebody with a two-by-four two by stuck in their eye? Now we might think of somebody, if Jonathan had a speck in his eye, and I say, Jonathan, let me help you get that speck out of your eye, and I've got this pen stuck in my eye. He'd say, get away from me, man. Talk about taking a speck out. You got a, you got a pencil in your eye. What's the idea? We're trying to correct others. And we got more problems than they do. Right? So before you take the two before out of somebody else's eye or the speck out of somebody else's eye, make sure you don't have a two before in your own eye. Because there are some people who can be so merciless in judging and criticizing others. And the ones that do that tend to have more faults than the ones that are criticizing. Amen. I mean, they're always looking for something to criticize. They're always putting others down for the splinter they have in their soul when they've got a spear stuck in themselves. I heard about a preacher he said a lady came to his office one day, and she was a terrible gossip. Had all kinds of problems, all kinds of sinful habits. She came by and said, Preacher, you got to pray for my sister. She recently started wearing makeup. That really concerned her. 
that her sister started wearing makeup. She's concerned about that speck in her sister's eye. And she ignores all the problems she's got. Amen. Jesus is saying it's not our place to judge people. We should be more concerned about our own lives, examining ourselves and our relationship with God and others. The third thing is this. Here, let's note the response we take for ourselves. Back in verse 5, he gives us the response. First, take out the beam out of your own eye. That's the first thing that must be done. Before you deal with anybody else, first of all, examine yourself and see if there's something in your life that you need to deal with. Deal with your own faults. Deal with your own failures. And that's going to be a full-time job, isn't it? Do that first. And then if you've got any time left, maybe you can help others around you. That word first speaks of making that first in time, first in importance. The priority of your life and my life ought to be removing things in our life that's not right. Clean up your own life first. Write this verse down, James 4, verses 11 and 12. Here the Bible says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are thou that judges another? Somebody wrote this and said, I dreamed death came the other night. Heaven's gate swung wide. And an angel with a halo bright ushered me inside. And there to my astonishment, Stood folks I judged and labeled as quite unfit, of little worth, and spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips, but were never set free. For every face showed stunned surprise, no one expected me. Amen. People are going to be surprised to see you there. You remember in the Old Testament when God sent snakes into the camp because the people were murmuring and complaining. And he sent snakes to bite people and people were dying because their, God was sick of their murmuring. I thought about that. What if God sent snakes in here to bite all the critics and murmurers? Would you make it out alive? <laughs> Amen. That's what first ought to be done. Examine yourself. And then finally, what can be done, then you can help others. Jesus said, Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, you may need to help a brother like that. We ought to help one another. But don't ignore the, we don't ignore the fact that others have problems. But after all, it's just a moat in most cases. And we can help them with that. See, when your heart is right, after examining yourself and getting right with God, then you can view things in the right manner, the right viewpoint. Jesus said in John 7, 24, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So we are to judge, but judge righteously. There's a difference, isn't it? You may not be able to judge a tree by its leaves, but you can judge it by its fruit. You don't judge a book by its cover but you can judge it by its contents. 
Paul said this in Galatians 6, 1. He said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Instead of having a critical spirit, thinking that you would never do what others have done, always keep in mind what we have to deal with. You ever heard, but by the grace of God go I? How many ever heard that? For by the grace of God go I. You know that's not in the Bible? One day I was looking for it. I was going to quote it. I wanted to know what the scripture was. And I looked and I looked and it's not in the Bible. But for the grace of God, there go I. It's not there. The closest you can get is 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Where it says, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Now, if I'm wrong about that, but for the grace of God, there you go, I show, show me where it's at because I, I couldn't find it. A lot of times we think there's something in the Bible that's not there. God helps those who help themselves, right? That's not in the Bible either. But we won't go that way. Here's the thing. Is it ever right to pass judgment on others? I think there are times when we should and can there are times mentioned in the Bible when we are to exercise judgment on others. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, you read about a man in that church who was guilty of adultery. Paul wasn't even there, but he got word and was convinced of it, and he judged that man and told the church to judge him and put him out. To exercise discipline to protect the reputation of that church. Third times we have to do that. Jesus calls on his disciples to judge those who may not be worthy to receive the word of God. Now, that seems strange. How can that be? When he says there in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, or cast your pearl before swine, because they'll just trample them under their feet. I think Jesus did that with the Pharisees. He'd already judged them as being reprobates who would not accept the word of God. So he didn't spend a lot of time trying to teach them. So that's Jesus. He would know. But I think there's times when we can tell by knowing the word of God and knowing what others believe and practice, we can make an honest judgment about certain people. Go to Matthew, we're here in Matthew 7. Look down at verses 15 through 20. Let me show you this. Matthew 7, verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now you might look at this well, Jesus, you're not supposed to judge people like this. You're not supposed to inspect their fruit. You're not supposed to call people ravening wolves. Jesus, we'll forgive you this time, but don't do it again. Right? Because a lot of people, they don't like that kind of preaching. That calls out what is false and untrue. Matter of fact, in John chapter 6, Jesus is preaching. It says in John 6, 60, People have said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Talking about what Jesus was preaching. 
And he goes on to say in verse 66, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were offended. Because Jesus was judging others and their false teaching. Now some would have us believe that there should never be a time when we should criticize or judge others. They said we should always be indulgent and always be tolerant for the sake of peace and unity. See, that's the core of ecumenism. The idea that we should just forget about doctrine, just all come together and be one big happy family. Does that bring harmony? To forget doctrinal beliefs and just, just come together? Does that really bring harmony? Folks, listen, there's a difference between unity and harmony. You, you can take two tomcats and tie their tails together you might have unity. You're not going to have harmony. Right? There's not going to be any harmony at all in that. So we need to be careful about that. And understand that there's times to judge false doctrine. There's times to judge false teachers and reject them. Look at 1 John chapter 4. You'll see that. The Apostle John in writing his first epistle, if you look at chapter 4, the first three verses, he warns about this, doesn't he? John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ is coming to flesh, who stays coming to flesh, is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard it should come, and even now already is it in the world. There are many passages that say the very same thing. Jesus instructed the church to exercise discipline, which requires judging. He said in Matthew 18, 17, If he shall neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Sometimes the church will have to judge and evaluate. So you, see, you've got to be able to see the difference between hogs and logs and dogs. So I'll never see the difference. I always remember, we're going to get to the golden rule here pretty quick. That's something else the world knows about. Treat others as you would have them treat you. Well, that's a good rule to live by, isn't it? We need to be, when we need to be corrected, it's always good that we've got friends who will do that, but they will do it in the right spirit. Do it not in a mean, critical spirit, but in the right spirit. But like I said, we're all going to stand one day before the judge. The Lord God. Matter of fact, John 5, 22 says that the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. It'll be Jesus Christ that we'll stand before on judgment day. I said there's a judgment for the saved, there's a judgment for the lost. If you're not saved, there's a judgment for you. You will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that for rewards, but to look at the sin in your life that was never forgiven. And based on your rejection of Jesus Christ, you will be cast out into outer darkness for all eternity. So you're going to stand with the judgment of the saved or the judgment of the unsaved. But here's the good news. Lost friend, you can be saved today. You can come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He invites you to come. To receive him as your savior. And if you'll do so, he'll save you. He'll forgive your sins. He'll give you eternal life. Amen. See, we're all on a journey. It's going to wind up either in heaven or in hell. Make sure you're on the right path. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourselves. So stand as we have an invitation or hymn. This is the time we examine ourselves to decide if we need to respond to this invitation. If you're not saved, we'd like to invite you to come. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today.